Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for tonight's forum. We're really excited. Uh, a year ago, we had some amazing things happen in the world, in the Middle East, and in Egypt. And we had some great discussions, and we're kicking off uh, maybe a series of continued discussions, looking back and looking forward. Tonight's event wouldn't be possible without the co-sponsorship of the Harvard Kennedy School Middle East Initiative, the Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy, and perhaps most importantly, the Open Hands Initiative. Uh, the Open Hands Initiative was established by Jay Snyder, who's sitting here in the front, and it really a, it was an answer to President Obama's uh, encouragement to Americans to open their hands and reach out to people all around the world to do people-to-people people -people exchanges and to try to build and develop goodwill. And the, this particular forum got its start uh, in reaction to an exchange of journalists, American and Egyptian journalists, that worked together to cover the events over the last year. And what I have in my hand is a report, uh, a special report. If you go to globalpost.com slash special report, or click on special report, right, Charlie? That's right. Just Google it. You all can find it. <laughs> There's some great pieces of journalism in here that were a product of this collaboration. So we're really excited about tonight's forum. And to moderate tonight's forum is the editor-in-chief of the Daily Beast Newsweek, Tina Brown. Tina. Hi. Well, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to be here at uh, the IOP. Uh, you may be interested to know that where I went to uh, uh, where I come from, uh, Harvard was known as the Massachusetts, uh, uh, was better known as the Oxford of Massachusetts. And, uh, but having done my studies at Oxford, you'd think I would know better than to turn up in Cambridge in the middle of February, but here I am, and uh, it's very good to be here. So let's instead focus on the spring, the Arab Spring, paying specific attention to the events that began so dramatically in Tahir Square uh, almost a year ago this next week. Uh, as we know, millions of Egyptians brought their grievances and their anger and their hopes and dreams to Hiria Square last winter, and they continue to inspire democratic movements throughout the Middle East and around the world, not to mention protests uh, in places such as, you know, Occupy Wall Street. So it's been nothing short of breathtaking to watch the free exchange of powerful ideas and watch them just race around the world with this incredible sort of viral energy, and we stand in awe at their accomplishments. But these accomplishments, of course, are very fragile, and they're under constant threat of collapse. We saw this just this past week, this bloody soccer riots in Port Said, uh, which show us really what a tinderbox the whole situation can be as it tries to forge a new path to democracy. Uh, so the progress and the perils are really what we're here to talk about tonight. And uh, for the support of tonight's forum, I really want to thank uh, the Middle East Initiative the Shorenson Center on Press, Politics, and Public Policy, as we've heard, and also Open Hands Initiative, my friend Jay Snyder, which I think is such an imaginative and, and terrific new idea. Um, uh, actually, this summer, Newsweek and the Daily Beast are going to have a first initiative with Open Hands when we're going to have a joint journalism prize for uh, uh, Southeastern, uh, uh, Southeast, I'm sorry, I'm not being very coherent this evening, a journalism prize um, uh, uh, from Southeast Asia. So speaking of journalism, tonight's panel is very extraordinary. As a journalist, a professor, and a speaker, Mona Elzaway, who's on my uh, left here, is one of the world's foremost authorities on the Middle East, Islam, and the role of Muslims' women. Uh, Harvard's own professor, Tariq Massoud, joins us as well, a Carnegie scholar. He teaches public policy at the Kennedy School of Government, is a political scientist and Middle East specialist, published in foremost scholarly journals and publications. Uh, and then rounding out the panel is Charles Sennett, Vice President, Executive Editor, and Co-Founder of the brilliant Global Post, which is really an absolute you know, boon for foreign uh, journalists everywhere. And I'm a great admirer of it, actually. And he's made five trips to Egypt in this past year alone. So this evening, after so many dangerous places, should be a walk in the park yeah. for Charlie's Senate. And so let us begin with our panel. And Mona, I'd really like to turn to you, because you've just got back, I think, from Cairo. and. Um, We've all been reading about this unbelievable thing that happened in this, in this soccer stadium with 79 people were killed. Mm -hmm. um, is this outburst you know, indicative of something more uh, you know, co cosmically worrying that's happening in Egypt, or is this a kind of strange, uh, violent incident that doesn't bear any relation to the rest of what is going on? 
Right. Well, I mean, I, I start my talk today or, or my contributions today with my deepest condolences to all the families who lost people in Port Said yesterday, where I was coincidentally born, but my family's from Cairo. I think it's very important to understand that what happened yesterday wasn't just a case of soccer hooliganism or football fans who are crazy or Egyptians being inherently violent. I think these are the, like three scenarios that too many in the media have turned to. While the football fans involved, known as the ultras, do have a history of um, antagonism bet between the two sides. This is a side, a very popular side in Egypt called Ahli from Cairo. And the team from Port Said called Masri, they do have an arts rivalry. Many people expected it to be a very tense match between the two, and they have clashed in the past. But what is very unusual and what has caused a lot of people to question what exactly happened yesterday and to see it as something much bigger than a case of football hooliganism run amok is the fact that people were anticipating problems and that the police stood by and watched and did absolutely nothing. Now, according to testimony by the fans of the team that won, because it was, it was fans of the team who won who attacked the team who lost. Which is in itself very odd, unusual. Right? I mean, usually it's the, the losers who are furious and attack the winners. Exactly. But this was the other way around. This was the winners attacking the fans and the players of the winning side who were playing away from Cairo. And according to testimony that has been collected by many, but especially by uh, an organization that I particularly respect called the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, they have posted testimony by fans of the winning side saying, A, they were not searched when they entered the stadium. B, that they found among their fan base people with weapons, people they didn't recognize as belonging to the fan group that, was, that went out to, to, for, for the match. So this was thugs who were sort of inter, interwoven with exactly. the fans. Exactly. Yeah. So they believed that they were thugs who infiltrated their, their side, basically. And then when the violence did break out, a lot of fans from both sides said that the police who were there, the riot police essentially, watched and did nothing. Now, it's very important to remember that the teams of the losing side, the Ahli Ultras, they're called, or Ultras Ahlawi, they have a long vendetta with the police that, that predates the revolution. But this ended up, when the revolution began in Egypt on January the 25th last year, the Ultras were on the front lines of the revolution, which again, why a lot of people are looking at, at what happened yesterday with a lot of questions. Today actually marks the first anniversary of the Battle of the Camels, when the Mubarak regime sent in camels Indiana Jones style to break up protest in Tahrir Square. And the Ultras fans, the fans of Ahli, the, the team that was attacked yesterday, they were on the front lines protecting Tahrir. And they've been on the front lines of the revolution from then. So that there is this tension so it's, between it's the police and the be fans. And so a lot of people believe that the police did nothing and possibly interjected these thugs into the match as a way of revenge or to avenge the, the, this very pivotal role of the ultras. But you know, ultimately, when you, when you kind of step back and look at it in the big scheme of things, it is a, a security vacuum that many people in Egypt believe is deliberate. Because also, a year today, Hosni Mubarak said, it's either me or chaos. And the Mubarak regime has not been removed. Mubarak has been removed. But I often say we've replaced one Mubarak with 19 Hosni Mubaraks. And that is Field Marshal Tantawi and the 18 men who constitute the military junta that runs Egypt today. Mm -hmm. So this regime has for a very long time said it's either us or chaos. chaos. Tarek, can I, this is amazing. I mean, that's a great sort of potted uh, description of this seething you know, conflict that's, that, that you're describing. Um, Tarek, do you agree with Mona that, that, it's, that this is really a kind of underlying stoking of, of violence by the uh, 19 mini Hosni Mubaraks that are now running the show? Um, it, certainly, it's a plausible uh, thesis. Let me just step back for a minute, because what we've got happening in Egypt right now is a transition, okay? Transition from a dictatorship, maybe to another dictatorship, if Mona is right, maybe to a democracy. And in transitions, they are inherently uncertain, and you can't judge them on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. You really have to take a kind of long view. Uh, because transitions, even successful ones, if we look at them, we find that they were incredibly bloody. There's lots of discouraging things that happen, even in the course of successful uh, transitions. So if we step back and we look at Egypt right now, so certainly what Mona said is right. One reason to be very disappointed is that Egypt, a year after the revolution in Tahrir Square, is run by the military. This is not what the people died in Tahrir Square for, right? They did not die for Field Marshal Tantawi to rule over them. 
But at the same time, the military has said that they're going to exit in June. Now they're talking about uh, moving up the timetable for exit to May. Okay? So there may be a reason for optimism here. We may, in fact, find that the military will step out at least of the formal role of day-to-day -day governance. Right? So that's on the, there's reason for pessimism, but a reason for optimism. Another reason for pessimism, obviously, is that the economic grievances that animated the revolution, or at least in part, are still present. And in fact, the economy is getting worse in Egypt. The foreign reserves are dwindling rapidly. So yes, we should be concerned, especially when this starts to impact people's uh, daily lives and their ability to eat, uh, which will, will uh, stoke a crisis. But at the same, and, and another reason for pessimism, as you, we, I think Mona mentioned, we just had a parliamentary election in Egypt, which produced a parliament that wasn't necessarily reflective of our greatest ambitions for a liberal and pluralistic Egypt, right? It's a parliament that's dominated by Islamists, not just the Muslim Brotherhood, but this new force that people are finally coming to terms with called the Salafis, who seem to be much more conservative and much more radical than the Muslim Brotherhood. But at the same time, it was a freely elected <coughs> parliament, okay? This is the first time in Egypt's modern history that you've had a parliament that actually represents the will of the Egyptian people. And so this, I think, if we compare where we are now to where we were in the dark days of Hosni Mubarak, there are real reasons for us to be cautiously optimistic. And the next few months will be really critical, but we can't yet uh, say that the Egyptian revolution has failed. Right, okay. That's um, encouraging, and more encouraging from you. Charlie, you did a very interesting PBS Frontline documentary about the uh, Muslim Brotherhood. And of course, it's ironic that all those years of Mubarak uh, and also, frankly, here, we kept on hearing about the big scare of what would happen if you know, the, the, uh, the Brotherhood got in. Now, of course, there's something more radical than the Brotherhood, which is the Salafists. Tell me, you know, tell us all here what you learned in this documentary you did yeah. on the Brotherhood and how you think it's going to play out with the Salafists. Well, I think, you know, Mona made an interesting point, which is Mubarak always set up a dichotomy where it was either Mubarak's regime or chaos. And code for chaos was the Muslim Brotherhood. Yeah. What he meant by that in telegraphing to the United States and to the Egyptian people is it's me or it's Islamist regime. And I think that fear and exposing that fear was a big part of the revolution. That the Egyptian people finally said, we're tired of that. Because while you've been telling us that, our economy has, has declined dramatically. Our opportunities for young people just aren't there. Uh, no one is feeling like Egypt is moving forward in, that, in the way you've created that equation. What was interesting about the revolution is it was a secular youth movement that came out into the street and got the ball rolling using Twitter, using Facebook, and, and using all the tools of social media. But what interests me, being in Tahrir Square in those unbelievably heady days of the revolution, was I thought the tipping point was when the Muslim Brotherhood decided to come in. They came in late, but they came in with a lot of organization, a lot of strength, a lot of momentum. And there were these, these just moments I thought I'd never see in Egypt of you know, a secular, sort of hip secular kid from Zamalek, the wealthy upper class neighborhood of Cairo, and his little, you know, his tent, like a Coleman, nice tent, right next to a plastic tarp used by all these Muslim Brotherhood guys. Mm -hmm. And seeing them mix together was what many of them called the Tahrir moment, where they saw that together they may have a future. And that's why I would share with Tarek some of the optimism of where this revolution is headed. But I think, realistically, 40% for the Muslim Brotherhood in Parliament, 25% for the Salafists, 65% Islamist majority in Parliament, if I were a person who, who wanted a secular life, I would be worried about Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a challenge to the secular movement that started the revolution, and it's a great challenge to America, to American foreign policy. We proclaim our belief in democracy. Well, democracy is a, it is has a, spoken. It is a very um, uh, ironic dilemma, obviously, that you, know, you, you, you grant, as it were, you help to ferment democracy, and then what you get is something far more that, radical. That, something that, that, that could really well, challenge of course, I mean, your... One of the things that, that is very worrying with this new Islamist, uh, you know, reinforced strain, is is for women. It's it's not good news. And I think one of the most disappointing things has been the way to see the women sort of shut out and left as the dust, as it were, while this uh, this so-called uh, you know progress is made. 
tell about what are your feelings about that. I mean, you're, what you've seen about that, and whether things are going to improve for women, or whether they, and how, how the women of Egypt are responding to what is going on around them. Well, I want to make it very clear that I'm not scared of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I'm not scared of the Salafis. And, and the reason that I say I'm, I'm scared of neither, and I remain very optimistic about the Egyptian revolution, is what I saw on the 25th of January, just last week. And that was one of the reasons that I went back to, to Egypt. I wanted to be there for the anniversary of the 25th. And what happened on that day was hundreds of thousands of Egyptians from all over Cairo, and I'm sure the same scenario repeated itself in many other cities, came out onto the streets for simultaneous marches that, that led, that, that headed towards Tahrir Square. Now, there were two scenarios playing out on that day. One was the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis celebrating, because for them, Joining the revolution and then the, the, the elections gave them, as Charlie said, 65% of the parliament. But for the rest of us that took part in the marches, and marches started from all points in Cairo, and who ended up in Tahrir Square, it was not a celebration because for us it was the revolution continues. And there was a, a, po a point where we were entering Tahrir Square and the Muslim Brotherhood had these loudspeakers and they were playing Quran and they were celebrating and we were entering Tahrir Square chanting very loudly, this is, this is a revolution, not a celebration. So this was where the Tahrir moment perhaps dissolved, but dissolved, I believe, for the good of Egypt because Mubarak was what united everybody who, who joined the revolution. But now we have to learn to live with each other's differences. And obviously women, for me, as a feminist, is, is a core part of how we're going to deal with these differences. And the reason that I say I remain optimistic is that everywhere I looked on the 25th and on the 23rd, two days before that, on the first day of Parliament, I joined a, a, a march from the Opera House to the Houses of Parliament that, that was set, that was launched by artists. It was artists, writers, and creative types. It was basically a march for freedom of expression. So there was a march for freedom of expression. There was the march on the, the January the 25th. And then another march I joined in Alexandria on Friday, just before I came back. And every single one of those marches was filled with women. So despite you know, the attacks on women, I mean, I myself had my arms broken by right police. You're sitting there with your two broken arms. You should tell the audience what happened to you. Well, very quickly, last November, I was assaulted by Egyptian right police. They broke my, right, my left arm and my right arm and sexually assaulted me. And hundreds of Egyptian women, men as well too, but when it comes to sexual assault, hundreds of Egyptian women have been specifically targeted by the security forces and soldiers in Egypt, very famously the image of the woman being dragged through Tahrir Square in December who was stripped down to her underwear. Despite this, despite this systematic assault on women that is aimed at silencing and shaming us, Egyptian women continue to be out on the street, despite the fact that less than 1% of the Egyptian parliament is, is made up of women. We continue to be out on the street. And why are we out on the street? Every single person I met on the marches, the March for Freedom of Expression, the March to mark the, the January the 25th, they said to me, we're out today to tell the military they have to go. And so we were chanting down, down with military rule. But just as importantly, we're here to tell parliament, i.e. the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, that we are here. We will continue to be here. We see you and we will hold you accountable in the way that we held Mubarak accountable. This is what keeps me optimistic about Egypt. Because the Muslim Brotherhood have been elected to do certain things. If they don't improve the economy, if they don't create jobs, if they don't fix, if they don't perform well on the foreign policy, if, 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 they will be voted out. In the meantime, what has changed forever in Egypt is us, the Egyptian people. We are now on the street. 849 people were injured in Cairo just today because of demonstrations against what happened in the football match yesterday, which says to me Egypt has changed forever. We might not have got rid of the, the, the regime, but what we got rid of was this idea that the Egyptian people don't come out and demonstrate. No, we demonstrate, and we tell anyone who's going to rule Egypt today, we are here, and we're going to hold you accountable. And that's what keeps me optimistic about women as well, because there's a whole host of women's groups that I'm involved with and I meet when I go to Cairo who are forming a pressure group that is going to lobby parliament, that is going to send out, you know, one of them contacted me today, it's the Egyptian Women's Union. This union was launched by Hodesh Arawi in 1923. It was for a time led by Nawal Sadawi. It is now led by women and men. And they were complaining just today about the fact that the Labour Force Committee in parliament wants to reduce the age of retirement for women to 55. So again, we're watching you and we're gonna hold you accountable. Well, Shari, what is your feeling about that? I mean. Is democracy going to be good for Egyptian women or not? I mean, it doesn't sound, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to hear about the strength of the women out on the streets, but it takes more than that. It takes actually formal involvement in the political process. It, 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 it means having women, you know, actually acting in, in governmental positions to, to make a difference rather than simply protesting. Well, what are your feelings about that? that 
I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, would, it, it would be unwise of me to sort of uh, pass judgment at this moment. What we do know is that the Mubarak regime uh, derived some of its international legitimacy by being seen to be the champion of women's rights. And so uh, Suzanne Mubarak, the wife of the president, uh, had all kinds of initiatives that were, at least on the face of them, geared towards uh, promoting uh, the rights of women. What this did, though, by attaching the very legitimate cause of women's rights, by her uh, attaching that cause and co-opting it uh, to the uh, regime, uh, kind of delegitimized it uh, in a way. And so there's going to have so to be- It's so ironic because, I mean, you know, the, the fact that Suzanne Mubarak has such an imagery of, of corruption, really, and, and, and in terms of, uh, you know, all that, that nepotism and, and, you know, rewarding of her family and stuff, and yet, in fact, in the area of women's rights, she really was trying to do something good, right? You, well, I mean, you know, there's- Or was, the, there's, it, a, or was it PR? There are, well, that's the thing. There are these photographs. If you ever go on uh, Google and look for uh, the NDP headquarters, which are the headquarters of the uh, uh, the former ruling party, which are, you know, you always see this iconic image of it as a charred hulk. And often the image is actually not of the NDP, it's of the National Council for Women, which was right next door, which was Suzanne Mubarak's uh, organization. Yeah. Um, but basically, I think that um, with, I think that as Mona is saying, there are groups that are organic, that uh, are inextricably intertwined with the opposition and with the revolutionaries who are also now pushing this agenda for women's rights. So I think there will be, uh, there's reasons for optimism there. The bigger problem is that we've got to recognize that democracy doesn't always produce liberalism. Right. Yeah. You can have democratic procedures that don't produce liberal governments. Okay. And we may have to be okay with that in, in some parts of the world. And the liberals in Egypt are also going to need to figure out a way in which they can mobilize votes and attract votes in an environment where people are more comfortable perhaps with Islamists, right? The Egyptian term for liberal is, the Arabic term that's used is liberali, which is a made, it's an, it's an English word pronounced in an Arabic accent. And so when you go to somebody and say, Ana liberali, you're already saying, I'm coming from Mars. And so m maybe what they need is to develop a kind of indigenous discourse and the groups that uh, Mona is talking about are, are doing that hard intellectual labor. Interesting. Uh, I think that's, that's fascinating, um, uh, Charlie. Uh, one of the first things, of course, that, that Mona was able to do after she was assaulted was she actually had, before the phone went dead, the ability to tweet out that uh, she had, in fact, been arrested. Um, do you think that we, we, we've heard, and you mentioned that, that social media did play a big part, but is it... Was that overhyped here? I mean, do, did social media play such a seminal role, do you think, in the Egyptian revolution, and will it continue to play? I think it did play a central role, and I think it will continue to play a role of helping Egypt find its way forward, because people are communicating. I mean, I got your tweet right away. We, we, we immediately put your unbelievably great interview with NPR up, where you talked about the need for another revolution in Egypt for a revolution for women in Egypt and a, and a sort of revolution of the mind. You know, change, everyone needs to really find more fundamental change. That dialogue was flying around the world. And um, I think that that is the extraordinary moment of the Egyptian revolution. That's why it's the first digital revolution. The first Facebook uh, page that was built, we are all Khalid Saeed now by Wael Ghanim, or at least he did admin on it, and he'll be here tomorrow night. Um, that really did bring a community together uh, the Facebook girl who began the call to come to Tahrir Square on January 25th, that put tens of thousands of people in the square. The uh, documentary that we at Global Post worked on with Frontline really captured that moment well, I thought, of coming together. Um, it was a happening, but I, I would still argue that tens of thousands who came to the street, it, not, it would not have been a revolution if the Muslim Brotherhood youth didn't tell the Muslim Brotherhood, you have to get involved, this is the moment. And then it was people power. Guys from the Muslim Brotherhood with calluses on their foreheads and calluses on their hands from poor districts like Shobra and other parts of Cairo who poured into that square. And it was the human moment because when they shut off the internet, the day that Mubarak tried to shut it down, that's the day the street demonstrations blew wide open. And I think the, the, uh, the truth is that social media can only take us so far, or could only take Egypt so far, and that it will be up to the people, and that Tahrir Square was an expression, ultimately, of 
people in the street. I mean, out of that sort of huge melee in Tahrir Square, who is emerging? Um, maybe you might take that question, Tariq, but who is emerging as you know, a future leader? I mean, who is really uh, coming forward now and, and showing themselves to be you know, a statesman, if you like, of the liberales in a way? Oh, well, that's a very interesting question. I don't know that I can think of anybody, uh, but I think that's part of the glory of Tahrir that, I mean, look, this is, we're not talking about an old movement here. We're talking about something that's only a year old, and that is, as you described it as kind of melee. I would, I, I would describe it, yes, as this kind of, you know, a multiplicity of voices and organizations and groups with shifting alliances that the Muslim Brotherhood youth that you talked about have now left the Muslim Brotherhood and tried their own... Uh, and which and failed spectacularly. What about Amr Hamzawi? Would you consider him someone who came out of that? Uh, out of Tahrir? I would, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to comment on a personality, but Amr Hamzawi, I, I will tell you one He came thing. out of Carnegie, but he actually so our, our, appeared our, in the square powerfully, right, didn't right. he? Uh, so Amr Hamzawi is a, 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 a political scientist uh, who was a professor at Cairo University and before that was a, a scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and has basically established himself as the voice of liberalism in Egypt and is actually quite an extraordinary uh, person. And so I will only say that I recently saw a photograph of uh, the uh, new Egyptian parliament and there was Amr Hamzawi standing there with his flowing hair and uh, there were several other parliamentarians next to him who were Islamists and I looked at this photograph and who, uh, which is composed of people who were all on the outs in the old regime. You could never have imagined under Mubarak seeing these people under the dome of parliament. And so I actually felt quite exactly. optimistic after seeing that photo, yeah. Did you feel the same way? I mean, did you, well, who were the people, uh, Mona, that you've encountered that seemed to you to speak as the future of Egypt in terms of leadership? Well, it's really important to remember that for the past 60 years, ever since Egypt fell under military rule, ever since the military seized power, Every president that has ruled Egypt since then, there's been four, Mubarak being the last, has consistently worked to keep out any kind of vibrant opposition, except for the Muslim Brotherhood, because basically they couldn't shut down the mosque. And so the most vibrant opposition would come was, was mosque-based. So when people look at Egypt and, and, and they ask, where are the leaders, you have to understand that these four di dictators from an army background deliberately kept people away because they did not want alternatives mm -hmm. to their power. So it's not that Egypt lacks leaders, it's they that every no time came up. They've had no practice. Exactly. And, so, and you know, this was beautifully captured when I was in Alexandria for this seven-hour mega march. We took two, two hours off to go and eat pizza. And one of the young women around this table of like 15 young people, I mean, I was looking at them and I told them, well, I'm old enough to be your mothers because, you know, they're all 21, 22, and I'm 44. And I'm sitting there and the energy is palpable. And, this, and an older woman was, was, was being kind of typically cautious and saying, don't go to the ministry of this, don't go to the ministry of that, they're trying to trap you. And then this 20-year-old says to her, you know what, we're going to go everywhere we want. We have to go everywhere. We're not scared. And another one said to her, and this is, this is by way of explaining how the leaders are coming up. Another one said to her, look, we're young, we have no experience in politics, we don't know, most of the time we don't know what we're doing, but we want to keep this revolution romantic and pure. She used those words, romantic and pure. Mm -hmm. So you've got a young generation of people who are heady with finally being able to speak, finally being able to go out there, not interested in having another charismatic leader tell them what to do, but recognizing among, among themselves many, many leaders. I mean, one young man that I always talk about is, uh, he's almost 30, I think he just turned 30, called Ala Abdel Fattah. He's the reason that I moved back to Egypt in 2005 to take part in protests that were instrumental in this revolution, one of many catalysts. Alaa would never call himself a leader because he's very humble, but he comes from a family of amazing activists. His father's a human rights lawyer, his mother's a great activist who teaches at Cairo University, his sister is a co-founder of No Military Trials, his younger sister is also, also an activist, and he just came out of two months in jail after trumped-up charges. Now, he sits out down on Twitter, and he has this great excuse me, great vision of what Egypt should do. Now, he, again, he would never say, I'm a leader, but there are so many young people like him, given a chance, six to seven years from now, I can definitely see them either running for politics, becoming thought leaders. They already are thought leaders. So what I'm saying is that this revolution of the mind that Charlie was saying, I, I talked to NPR about, 
In Egypt right now, we're having a political revolution that, yes, has created a parliament, as, as Tarek said, that is very different. But we're also having a parallel revolution of the mind. That is a social, cultural, and also sexual revolution that we need in Egypt, that unless it happens in tandem with a political revolution, that our political revolution will fail. Because we finally have a chance in Egypt now to say what we want, to go out and demonstrate when we want, and to also acknowledge that you know, these, these um, elections were not great. They, they were not free and fair. They were, they were a mess, but they were our mess. Mm -hmm. And the next time around, there will be a better mess. Mm -hmm. That's our hope. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> exactly, a better mess, which is what we're hoping for. So we get a question. Charlie, you've been doing this amazing work with Open Hands Initiative to support Egyptian journalists. And of course, there is no such thing as a, you know, a path to democracy without a free and, and uh, you know, strong press. Mm. So what have you found amongst Egyptian journalists? I mean, what kind of a, of yeah. a press is it in, in Egypt now? And, and, and uh, you know, what, are they, what are they saying? What are they writing? Well, what, what we found with the, with the fellows we worked with, Global Post, Open Hands Initiative, we brought together 16 reporting fellows, eight Egyptian, eight American, one Egyptian editor who was our counterpart as an editor. Um, what we found were extraordinary young people who are part of this heroic movement who are young journalists. Some of the American fellows are here. They're kind of clustered. Can you guys quickly raise your hands? We have five of them right here. They, as a team of Americans and Egyptians, did exactly the mission of Open Hands Initiative. They worked together, people-to-people -people diplomacy, and the journalism exploded off the page. You could feel the intensity of it, uh, particularly in the way they worked together. I mean, truly extraordinary work. Um, and I came away so hopeful about this young generation of journalists in Egypt. They're excited. They're very hip to social networking. They, they really understand the web. We had to, at one point, Gary Knight, who, who joined me in, in teaching the workshops, mandated they all stop tweeting. Because it's just taking up, they, they couldn't concentrate on anything else. <laughs> and we really tried to work with them on the craft of journalism, and they just grabbed it. So it was exciting. I think the other reality is bleak, which is an older generation of journalists who are part of a sclerotic Arab nationalist, you know, just, just the, the press that has kept so much of the, of the Arab world down. It's taught them to focus more on things like Israel than on the disasters of their own country. This younger generation sees those journalists as standing in the way, I think. And there's a younger generation of journalists that really wants to push past a lot of the paradigms of the past and really do good, hard street reporting. Really look at people, tell their stories. These, um, this team broke the story of, of Samira, who was another hero of the revolution. Samira is a young woman who stood up to the, to the uh, so-called virginity test. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but a terrible uh, practice of, of female protesters actually being uh, administered, quote, virginity tests by uniformed male officers. She called it rape, took her, her case to court, and they chronicled her story, and she actually won in court, and her case put a stop to that. I, I think they did great work, both the American and Egyptian journalists, and uh, I think there's a lot of hope for the young journalists. Yeah, that was an absolutely superb piece of journalism that was really, I mean, created such waves. So extraordinary, really, a work there. I think we'd probably like to start to go to some questions from the audience, because there's so many incredibly well-informed people here. And I've been told that everybody has to identify themselves and ask one question and make sure that you end your question with a question mark, as it were. I mean, don't make <laughs> declamations and speeches. So I'd love people to start to come up and, and ask some questions of our panel here. Um, Marvin Brands from uh, Divinity School here. I think this question is probably uh, best directed to Amona, since she was associated or is associated with the Jerusalem uh, report. And that is, uh, through your eyes, what is, what is uh, Israel's view of the Arab Spring in Egypt? Is it uh, welcoming? Is it concerned? Is it hesitant? Especially since it has a, a peace agreement with Egypt. I mean, I, I don't know what Israel's view is. I wish we had someone from Israel on the panel to talk about Israel's view. But what I can tell you is that when the Egyptian revolution started last year, uh, the Israeli prime minister actually sided with Mubarak, much to his shame. Now, Israel is a country that 
has often preached to the rest of the Middle East that it's the only democracy in the region and mostly a democracy for its Jewish citizens, because if you spoke to Palestinian citizens of Israel, they will tell you that they, they don't enjoy the kind of democracy that Jewish citizens of Israel do. Mm -hmm. So to, to watch a prime minister of a supposedly democratic country side with a dictator that a neighboring country is trying to get rid of in order to, to make Egypt a democracy as well, for me, spoke volumes. And for me, said that Israel was much happier supporting a dictator than a democracy. But then, you know, this country, the US, five different US presidents supported Hosni Mubarak, knowing very well that he was a dictator. So you're talking basically about, you know, the, the kind of the dirty dealings of politics in which mm -hmm. the supposed stability of a dictator is favored at the expense of the freedom and dignity of a people. Now, to be quite honest, I'm not paying any attention to Israel right now because I'm too busy with what's happening in Egypt. And that is exactly what most Egyptians will tell you. Our, our goal is a free and dignified Egypt, and we will free Egypt. And whether our neighbors, be they Israel or Saudi Arabia or anyone else in the region don't like that, then quite honestly, too bad. Because what the way politics should be played is to understand that stability comes from a population that is happy and that is free. Stability should not come from one man who promises you stability at the expense of his people. So, uh, you know, once again, I can't tell you how Israelis feel about what, what's going on in Egypt. I can only tell you how Egypt feel, uh, Egyptians feel. But I do remember what Benjamin Netanyahu said, and I think that speaks volumes, that he obviously sided with a dictator. A good answer. Coming up next. Um, thank you, firstly, all of you, for your comments. My name is Joel Brownald. I'm a graduate student here. I just want to bring you back to the events of yesterday at the football stadium. And um, I took all of your, your points you made, Mona, but I come from a country also plagued by football hooligans. Um, and I don't think it was unique to Egypt. I think if you take the police out of the equation at a Millwall match, I think you would unfortunately get the same results. Um, so my question for you is, there's, there's often ways you can read into a situation, and you could be completely right that there was a, there was a plot that the, you know, with the ultras and everything else. But part of me just feels that you know, sport can heal, but sport can hurt. And there's a lot of pent-up aggression, and the police don't want to be too out there because of what happened. So to what extent is it, is it useful to try and put so many layers onto what was a tragic event of what, you know, hooliganism's international, it doesn't release the evil of Egyptian anger. Everyone's angry when it comes to football, and it's not particularly nice. So what's the benefit in putting so many layers above it to try and analyze it almost to death? Right. Uh, hooliganism, as you say, is not exclusive to Egypt. And, you know, I grew up in the UK, so <laughs> I, I remember. But it is not usual to have 74 people killed after a football match. That, that, if that was usual, then the sport of football should just be banned. It, it doesn't happen every day that 74 people die, thank God. And I, as I said, you know, the ultras do have a history of this, this antagonistic history with other teams. These two particular sides do have an arch rivalry. Yes to all of that, but 74 people being killed. Is, is, there's something wrong with 74 people being killed. And, and so many, all those things that I listed, the fact that weapons were there, the fact that the stadium lights were turned off, the fact that, that some, some doors were open, some were closed, the fact, the fact that the police did absolutely nothing. And this is all testimony from the win winning side, not the losing side. And, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't like conspiracy theories, but it's, it's too tempting to, to see this as part of this chaos scenario, especially because now what has happened, and again, according to reports from journalists on the ground, these 849 people who, who were injured in Cairo today were injured as a result of clashes that the police started, not the demonstrators. So you have demonstrators who go out to demonstrate in front of the Ministry of the Interior. The police pick a fight with them, fire tear gas, fire all kinds of things at them. So it, it, that, that's the kind of scenario that, that I'm asking you to consider this game. I mean, I, I do not, I'm not trying to paint the ultras as angels, far from it, you know, and they will tell you we're not angels. But it's just there were so many question marks that you have to, you have to ask this, the, or you have to look at it as something beyond just hooliganism. Sorry, do you feel that, from what you know, that this could be a scenario? Uh, like I said, look, these are all plausible scenarios, and we can spend a lot of time with them. But I think, you know, Occam's razor, right, the simplest explanation is usually the right one. And what do we know about Egypt right now? Well, we know that the police as an institution are really, uh, you know, feeling under siege, are not doing their jobs. They are of very diminished capacity. 
Um, and so you can imagine a situation like this. The police say, you know what, if we get involved and we try to stop this hooliganism, we'll just be seen as you know, beating up citizens. So they say, let them go at each other. And it, that, so it doesn't require Tantawi to say, begin plan, Operation Chaos. It's just a yeah. kind of organic thing that happens. Well, it's kind because of what happened in London, actually. Uh, right. I mean, it's what happened really in the summer in London. The and fact just, is that just the quickly, police just, just didn't want to get involved because they were feeling you know, diminished at that point. It's just a, a quick reminder that the whole revolution began on January 25th, Police Day, right. because people were tired of the brutality and the corruption of the police. So this day, which was imposed upon them by the Mubarak regime to come out and celebrate your police was the day the revolution was started. It's why it's called the January 25th revolution. The ultras directly confronted the police. They went up and did their soccer football chants by incorporating a set of the, the other sports team. They called them the police on the other side. They antagonized the police. The police responded. The police are out of, completely out of control. The military, which was seen as heroic and keeping control in the last few months, sadly, has also spun out of control. So you had a situation yesterday where they fired the head of the football association, but they're not confronting the big issue, which is the police will need to be reformed dramatically. Just as the police, the RUC, needed to be reformed in Northern Ireland, it's going to take a long time. It's a huge challenge. And I, I really don't know even where you begin, but I know the conversation has to begin on, on, on renaming the police mm -hmm. and retraining the police. I, I think this is exactly right. I mean, we've, we're spending a lot of time talking about the military as the bad actor, but what really needs to happen, one of the prerequisites for democracy, is that you have to have coercion, but it has to be legitimate coercion. And who does that? The police. And the police have to be seen as legitimate. So absolutely, security sector reform in Egypt has to be number one on the agenda, and we're not really talking about it. You have to feel I, I, safe, right? You have to yeah, feel safe, and people yeah. don't. But I think the reason that we are talking about the military is because who rules Egypt right now? It's the military junta, and they yeah. are ultimately responsible. When I was detained, after my 12-hour detention, after my arms were broken and I was sexually assaulted, I actually had a senior officer in military intelligence tell me, and, and this, is, this is routine procedure, we don't know why you're here. And I said, that if you don't know why I'm here, who the hell knows why I'm here? And then he proceeds to give me the scenario of how, well, you know what's happening right now. The police are out of control. They do all these things, and we get blamed for it. Of course you get blamed for it, because you're running the country. Now, at this time last year as well, in Egypt, the, the, the Mubarak regime unleashed the police to terrorize people and, and hoping to end the revolution. It didn't work. And what did he do then? He pulled them all off. So there was this huge security vacuum. And at the same time, open the jails. We have on record prisoners saying that they were kicked out of prisons at gunpoint. Why? To terrorize the Egyptian people. How did the Egyptian people protect themselves? They didn't have police on the street. They formed neighborhood watch committees. That tells me that you have a police and you have a military who are not interested in securing people's safety. That is Egypt today. Before this football match, we had three armed robberies in two days in Egypt. Where are the police? But ultimately, where is SCAF, the military horse running the country? Mona, I might just add that the, the police, for sure, out of control, corrupt, brutal, they're the start, they start the revolution. I think the military suffers from something that militaries around the world suffer from, including the United States military in Afghanistan and Iraq, which is they don't know how to police. They're not trained for it, and they're actually trained to do the opposite, which is go out and attack. And so being on the streets just recently and watching, uh, I was there the day of the famous video of the girl in the blue bra. How many of you have seen that video? So that's an extraordinary image of the moment where the military went out of control and dragged this, this woman, a traditional woman. They did the most insulting thing possible with all the video cameras watching, which is pull her shirt up, strip off the habaya, drag her through the streets, beat her with truncheons. And then, as a sort of coda, a soldier, a military soldier, stomps on her chest with his, with his military boot. It's, uh, I'm, I, I think Egypt is the most extraordinary story I've ever covered in my 30 years as a reporter. The revolution is the most extraordinary turn of events. But I also think I'm, I'm, it's extraordinary because you're continually surprised. And I'm surprised to see the military become unhinged. And I think the US uh, 
embassy is quite worried about the way the military is reacting, even more than they're worried about the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, what right has now. been the repudiation of that incident? Has that been repudiation? Tantawi told Carter that they weren't stripping her, they were redressing her. That somehow her clothes fell off and the soldiers were actually wow. dressing her. This is what the man who currently rules Egypt is saying. And yesterday on television, regarding what happened at the football match, he said, well, the people should take care of the people, essentially. So we're talking, yes, the military don't know how to run the country, the yeah. military don't know how to police the country, which is why we, on the side of the revolution, are saying the military shouldn't be running the country. Because one of the number one demands, or one of the primary demands, of the revolution is civilian leadership for Egypt. Yes, they've said they're going to hand over power, but you know, they've promised a lot of things and have not kept to them. And the presidential elections coming up, most Egyptians I know do not believe they will be free and fair. Most Egyptians I know believe that the military will withdraw after they've put in their man. And if they put in Amr Musa, who is considered to be their man, who is very much of the regime, I am guaranteeing to you today that the, the streets of Egypt will be filled with hundreds of thousands of Egyptians. We're not fools in Egypt. We, we want to get rid of military rule, and we will get rid of military rule. But you as Americans, and I'm a, a US citizen too, have to understand that our tax dollars give the Egyptian military $1.3 billion every year. My American side helped to break my Egyptian side. That's the dilemma. Any, any more questions? Um, my name is Melinda Holmes, and um, last November I went to Egypt to study Arabic. Um, I traveled there several times before, and to do exactly what um, Charlie referred to as people-to-people -people diplomacy. I was very aware of that fact. Um, and I was there through the revolution and met my husband, who now stands over there, and we married in May, and I guess that's the ultimate form of diplomacy. Um, no problem. <laughs> but um, I, I wanted to address um, something to you, Charlie, because I'm very aware that even the, the, the best, some of the best forms of journal, journalism that are happening, um, and some of the best projects, such as the Open Hands Institute, doing this kind of people-to-people pe people, um, diplomacy, are accessing a very small segment of the uh, Egyptian youth. Yeah. Because, and as well as, um, social media. I mean, Facebook reaches, um, I'd say, pretty much the whole population, but uh, in terms of Twitter, and most Egyptian young people don't have access to the kind of mobile phones that, that use Twitter or, or don't know that. They don't have resources or awareness to be able to access um, fellowships and programs like the one that you host, which is, which is great. But um, in light of this, as well as the, the mainstream media, which over the last two days I have witnessed yet again how um, horrific the reporting actually is on events which happen in, in Egypt anyway. Uh, that's what I can speak to. Um, You're not reading Global what, Post, clearly. <laughs> sorry, what is, but what, the fact what, what, of the matter what, is most sorry, what, Americans... What, what is your are, question? Most Americans are not reading Global Post. And so oh, they're starting in, to. In uh, so in... in the Daily Beast. <laughs> <laughs> what, maybe what, in this room. So my what question is, your, is, is how question? can we... Sorry, what is your question? How can we connect um, the Egyptians who are, are not being accessed yeah. um, to I, have a voice outside of the country, and how can we um, show Americans what uh, they need to do in terms of our own political support in our own country, our own foreign policy um, in... in um Charlie, would you like Yeah, I, I will. You're going to have a hard time getting a word in edgewise, I'm telling you. <laughs> no, thank you. It's an excellent question, and I think that um, Open Hands Initiative's goal is to say, let's start somewhere. And you're absolutely right. The, the Egyptians we were dealing with uh, were, were English speakers, which puts them in a, in a very highly educated category of fluent English speakers who can write in English and write beautifully. So these were, these were absolutely the best of the best. But that's a good place to start. And I think that the goals of Open Hands Initiative to get people to communicate with each other and the power that creates and the friendships that creates, that ripples through time. That, that is a good place to start. I disagree with you about uh, mobile phones, because actually it's stunning, even in the poorest neighborhoods in Cairo, how many people are wired into text messaging, having content pushed to them, or, or are able to go to internet cafes and, and, and be online and be part of a conversation online. I think that um, you, know, you, you raise a very important point, and, and one that is framed by the reality right now in Egypt, which is that civil society is very much under attack. We've had NGOs that have been, uh, where people have been arrested and not allowed to leave the country. I'm sure you've all heard about this. 
This is a great threat to all of these movements like OHI that want to do this kind of people-to-people -people diplomacy. And I, I know the State Department is speaking out about it, but I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I, I don't think they're speaking loudly enough about it. This is a real threat to, to the kind of things, precisely the kind of things like OHI and others that need to be done mm -hmm. through the foundations that will do that kind of people-to-people -people diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Two more questions, I think. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, and I guess my question is this. As the revolution goes on, there's still, um, w well, obviously many issues, but one very uh, large issue that has not yet been resolved, which is, of course, what to do with uh, former President Hosni Mubarak, um, who currently stands trial right now. Um, it's obviously a very sensitive and important issue, especially given what has happened to other uh, leaders across North Africa and um, the Middle East that have been, I, I guess, taken out of power uh, due to the Arab Spring. Um, what is the general feeling of the Egyptian population? Do they, are, do they have a consensus? Are they divided? Um, what are their opinions about what to do with Hosni Mubarak? And of course, what are your beliefs about the rightful course of action? So interesting. That. Tariq, what is your view about, about Hosni Mubarak? I mean, we've seen, you know, uh, Gaddafi at the drain pipe. We've seen unbelievable sort of violence about what happens to the, to the leaders at the end. What are your feelings about Hosni Mubarak? So, so I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm not going to tell you <laughs> what do the Egyptian people think because I'm a overweight American Egyptian academic. I can't tell you uh, what the Egypt I haven't surveyed them on that question. But I can tell you what I think, which is that um, obviously Hosni Mubarak was guilty of significant malfeasance um, and deserves uh, whatever a sentence that is handed down. And I would note that what's happening in Egypt is worlds away from what happened to Qaddafi in Egypt. There is a kind of legal process that's being followed. And it has all kinds of imperfections, but it is nonetheless civilized. Um, but I think the issue here is a bigger one. We, you know, we've been talking about the military, very imprecise. What, did we talk, what do we mean when we're talking about the military and the military's interests? And what we should really do is focus on the 19 Hosni Mubaraks that uh, Mona talked about, who are the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. And these are the guys who run Egypt, and these are the people who you need to withdraw from the governance of the country. And for them to withdraw from the governance of the country, my <laughs> hypothesis is that they need to uh, feel secure that they are not going to find themselves in the same fate that has now befallen their uh, former leader, that they're not going to find themselves behind a cage in a court uh, uh, facing charges. And so I think making this kind of deal with the uh, military leaders may be, I'm not saying it is, it's a hypothesis, I'm not sure, but it may actually be necessary to get them out of the business of government, to get them to actually withdraw. Um, and so in this case, if, if in fact the military does have this anxiety, then the trial of Hosni Mubarak obviously intensifies that anxiety. One so of you're the great say, you're saying you'd rather see Mubarak sort of sent into exile, or rather that will help to get rid of the 19? Uh, look, I want justice. So I, I myself am conflicted because I think Mubarak needs to be held accountable and the 19 need to be held accountable. But at the same time, I also need the 19 to leave. And the 19 have guns. And so how do you get men with guns to listen to people without guns? You tell them, listen, we're not going to turn guns on you once you hand them over to us. Just, just quickly, uh, one, of the, one of the great challenges for, for Egyptian journalism and Western journalism is to hear more of the voices in other parts of the country. Uh, too often, we, and I'd, I'd say even, even our fellowship, we tried to get out there, but we didn't do enough. We, we need to get out into Sohag. You need to get into Fayoum and, and Minya. And you have to get these, this story. Because I don't think we know very clearly how the Egyptian people in sort of the, the, the silent majority feel about SCAF, feel about Mubarak. Well, and I do. think there's surveys. I mean, they have seven, SCAF has 70% approval. But that's Any dropping, credible survey that you do. Well, the Alaram because Center. Because they just represent <laughs> law and order. But wait, Pardon? Because they represent law and order. Right. Al Aram Center did that survey, which is controlled by the government. It's dropping. It went 90, 80, 70, 60. They did 60. it with, with the Danes, actually. And I know the, the Danish fellow who uh, did it. One of those uh, surveys, Gallup, Gallup said that the Gallup <laughs> survey said that the, uh, the Salafis would get 5 to 10 percent, and they got 25 percent. So I don't, I don't trust any of those. Well, surveys. it depends on what question you're asking. And, so and the Gallup asked, survey, exactly. I, you want to talk survey methodology, I'll talk to the cows come home. So, <laughs> no, no, um, I don't. Yeah. I just don't trust any of No, please. but that, that's not an intelligent position. Some surveys are actually better than others, 
And the survey well, so question that have, asked people... So many of them have been proven to be wrong. Well, you can be... Well, let me put it to you this way. We have all kinds of surveys in the United States that ask people before an election, who are you going to vote for? And often the election turns out to go the other way, and we don't say that the survey was somehow fundamentally flawed or that the government controlled the survey to give... So the point is, that question about SCAF approval, certainly also court, you know, so getting out to, so getting out to Fayoum is easy as pie. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, that's um, not a and, and the, you talk to there? people and they <laughs> will tell you. They're, when you ask ordinary people outside of Cairo, what do you think about the revolutionaries, okay? Eight out of 10 of them will not tell you that they are great and they're fighting for democracy. They'll say, yeah, yeah, about us. enough. Right. We want to get back to you normal. Can even hear that that's, in Tahrir now. I'm not saying that's a legitimate position yeah. at all. Sure. I'm not. I'm just giving they you just an empirical fact. Yeah. They just want to get on with right. their lives. Yeah. Right. This is just an empirical fact. I'm not saying that it's legitimate. Maybe they should be convinced that in fact the revolution the revolution needs to continue. But the empirical fact is, but, unfortunately, 70 percent of these people say the SCAP is doing a good job. And 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 a big part of that is that they're only watching government-controlled television, well, that, which that's is the giving thing. them well, these on. images. We, sure, have, we have more questioners here, so let's go to the... Okay, uh, my name is Nora Saheem, and I'm an Egyptian student at the Harvard Business School. And my question is to Mona, and I guess extends a bit beyond just the revolution. So as a woman, having been living in Egypt for a long time, one of the big issues that I see is sexual assault and verbal assaults and many kind of assaults. And would love to hear your views on what do you really think are the root causes, and therefore, how do you really start tackling this problem? There are many things being done, but you know, where do we start and why is it happening and increasing? Okay. Great question. Hi. This could be a panel discussion um, all on its own. I think it's important to see it on, on two levels. I think it's important to see it for sexual assault from the regime and sexual assault from the street. Because in 2005, the Mubarak regime began a systematic campaign of sexually assaulting and intimidating female activists and journalists. There, there was a very f uh, notorious day of a protest, May the 25th, 2005, in which many women were attacked, tried to raise a case. The regime said there's no proof, even though there were, there were lots of images loaded up on YouTube and on satellite channels, etc., etc. That was 2005. 2006 was the notorious aid attacks where now it was the street that was attacking women. And, and my theory of it, and it's not rocket science, when the regime attacks women and, and holds no one accountable, it sends out a signal that women are fair game. It gives out a green light basically to say that women are fair game. And then when the street then attacks women and the police stand by and do nothing as they did in 2006, that continues. There is no doubt, unfortunately, that the rates of sexual assault, sexual intimidation, and harassment against women in Egypt have been on the rise. Because after 2006, a very famous survey now conducted by the Egyptian Center for Women's Rights showed that more than 80% of Egyptian women face sexual harassment, groping, any you know, unwanted sexual attention, more than 80%. So this is a problem in Egypt. It, in Tahrir, unfortunately, it happens now. On the 25th, after this beautiful day of marching, there was a woman who was horribly attacked in Tahrir Square. So obviously, we, this, is why, this is what I mean by the, the revolution of the mind. This is an opportunity in Egypt now to say, look, women are attacked by the regime, women are attacked by the street, women are attacked. There is something about gender-based violence in Egypt that is horrific. We have to look it in the eye, and we must speak out about it, not just when it's the regime doing it to us, but when it's our fellow Egyptian men on the civilian level who are doing it to us. Because unfortunately, what's happening now is that when it happens, the first thing people say is, oh, but it was the police, or it was thugs, or it was the regime. Because we don't want to admit that it's happening from our fellow Egyptians. It needs a lot of honesty, it needs a lot of staring this in the eye, and saying this has to stop. And it can't happen from men protecting us. Because unfortunately, what's happening now is the regime attacks, my body then becomes this battlefield where Egyptian men feel that they need to attack back. I've had so many Egyptian men write to me and say, Dear sister, I cannot look you in the eye. I can't explain to you how humiliated I am for you, and I will avenge you and restore your honor. And I write back and say, Dear brother, thank you very much for your kind sentiments, but I assure you that together we will restore Egypt's honor because my honor is just fine, and the shame belongs to those who attack me, not to me. So this is our revolution of the mind in Egypt, in which we tell the men, your masculinity does not depend on protecting me and defending me. Your masculinity, my femininity, our Egyptianness, is our being free. That's what it is. And that takes me back, and I have to answer what you said about surveys. I can't not say you something. You just quoted a survey. No. <laughs> it's a survey that I like. <laughs> yes, you just his survey, but your survey yes. is wonderful. Because it's a survey that I like. 
time. It's wonderful. <laughs> no, no, very quickly. Mm. The thing about SCAF and the thing about Egyptians and the thing about the media, and this is why there are protests outside the TV and radio building, is that there is propaganda every day that is telling Egyptians the revolutionaries are going to burn Egypt. They said this on the 25th. They said, do not go down. I went to buy a mobile phone in Egypt, and they all disappeared from the shop. I said, where are the mobile phones? They said, we've hidden them because the looters are going to come. So they have painted us as these violent looters, hooligans, you know, over and over again. So in this scenario, of course the average Egyptian is going to say, oh my God, I want stability, because Mubarak for 30 years told them, it's me or chaos. So the protests outside of, of Maspiro are to, to get those average, you know, the average Egyptian now, the more they kill us, the more they break their arms. Do you know how many average Egyptians come up to me and say, they kiss me on the forehead, and they recognize that what SCAF is responsible for, but what the riot police did is quickly dwindling, dwindling their support for them. So they might have said this, you know, I don't know how many months ago, but if you talk to the average Egyptian and they see the blood that has been shed by the military, I don't think it's going to be 70% anymore. Yeah, well, hang on, before I we get on right. with the methodology slugfest that's going on over here. We'll talk well, later. We, have, we haven't can, talked can, methodology, can, yeah, but can emotion. We, can we please? <laughs> Lots of emotion. Uh, can, can we go to just, there's another uh, questioner, I think, which, which one was I this think this side was this waiting side first. Yeah. This side, is it? They're both Egyptian. So. <laughs> Thank you. My name is uh, Osama Ali. Um, I just came to the U.S. actually. Uh, my question for Mr. Tar. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, a, an, I'm an absolute opponent for like uh, for the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis. But like, don't you think that the classification of like Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafi movement under Islamists like is not fair since they don't have the same ideology and agenda, and since it's also like it creates kind of tension. Like because you know, like uh, like Muslim Brotherhood is not like good repute. Like like the reputation of Muslim Brotherhood is not good outside. So it's also I think it's bad for Islam as a religion. So that's my question. Um, so you're uh, the label Islamist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we gotta call them something, and so I'm just using the term that people use. But um, you know, there are probably people who engage in that kind of intellectual labor of coming up with new names for things. Uh, I don't do that. It's, it's, as, it's as vague and unproductive as like this, the broad religious right in America. You know, there are a lot of religious movements in America that are left, there are some that are right, and when you, go, when you lump them all together, I think you don't pay attention to the real, to the real fissures that matter. So I, I'd, I'd agree with you. It depends on what you're trying to do. Can we just go to the next? What is it? Hi, my name is Mona Moefi. Uh, I work in social, I'm a social epidemiologist. I do research here at Harvard. Um, I work a lot on surveys, so I have to jump in quickly on the survey thing. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no, but that's not my, I have a question. But quickly, I actually was um, having dinner with a friend of mine who works at Gallup at the end of October and told me that the approval rating for Salafis in Egypt was up above 20% and they weren't going to publish it. Uh, they said it's, so, it's too controversial. We're not going to publish they it. We're private. Gonna publish it. Oh, wow. They were not going to publish it. So I'm just oh. going to throw that out there. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, my question was actually about security and the Muslim Brotherhood. One year ago, uh, during the revolution, the Brotherhood was lauded for keeping security in Tahrir, and and it, it's one of the things that brought everybody together. And really, uh, one year later, I, I see it as a bit problematic that. Um, you know, two days ago or three days ago with the march to parliament, it was the brotherhood that was linking arms to protect the parliament while security forces were standing behind the lines with their weapons. So my question is, what do you think it's going to take um, to, to, to retrain security? I mean, what, from your opinion, especially, Mon um, and if you've been uh, thinking about this, you know, what do you think this shift, we keep complaining about security forces, what shift has to happen in order to clean that up? Well, what you're talking about is really, what, what she's talking about is three days ago, uh, there was a march to parliament and it was stopped through several of the streets were blocked by riot police and one of the streets was blocked by the Muslim Brotherhood. And there was a very interesting turning point here because a lot of people who began the march chanting down, down with, with military rule ended the march shout, shouting down, down with the Muslim Brotherhood. And that, that speaks to this idea that Egyptians are on the street saying, we're watching you and holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if the Muslim Brotherhood youth who were instrumental in protecting Tahrir, <coughs> excuse me, last year, are seen to turn into a militia just for the Muslim Brotherhood, then that is clearly going to chip away at any kind of popular sympathy that the Muslim Brotherhood long enjoyed because they were tortured and they were imprisoned by the Mubarak regime. When it comes to security um, uh, rehabilitation, 
it, it hasn't begun in Egypt at all. I agree with both Tarek and Charlie. We haven't even reached zero to even talk about it. There is no substantive discussion of what to do with the Ministry of the Interior. They continue to behave the way they did under Mubarak, and we just changed the name of state security to national security. So that same brutality continues, and unless there is a, a popular will, Parliament right now has no power. It's a parliament that sits under a military junta. So unless it comes from SCAF itself, which runs the country, I don't see it coming. I honestly don't know when it's going to happen. There has to be a popular and a political will for it. Thank you, Mayor. I think I'm being told madly to wrap up this very vigorous discussion. So I think I'm going to have to do that, unfortunately. I would love to go to more questioners, but I don't think we can do that. Can we over here? How, how much more time do we have? OK, great. Wonderful. We've got some more questions. Thank you. Can, I, can we just continue to go? Yeah, because let's we get feel, more questions. Let's get some more questions, because okay. otherwise. Hi, my name is Dina Kraft, and I'm a fellow at the Neiman Foundation for Journalism. Hi, Charlie. Hi. Um, and I've been based for many years next door to Egypt and uh, Jerusalem. I wanted to know, you talked a lot about the, the revolution, but what about the actual putting of Egypt back together, specifically the economy? So many Egyptians are desperately poor. What is it going to take to rebuild the economy and tourism right. as well? Yeah, I mean, this is the, you know, uh, you know 64,000 guinea uh, pound question. Um, uh, this is this is imp this is task number one. Uh, Egypt has huge unemployment. Egypt is uh, one of the world's biggest importers of wheat because you have this big subsidy program that you provide bread to all of these uh, people. They have all kinds of other subsidies that are completely inefficient, and you've got to re so you've got to reform this entire just dysfunctional system while at the same time trying to reform your political system to allow people to have more voice. So this is a huge task. The Muslim Brotherhood are not going to succeed at it, okay? And so, and I don't How do know, we know that? Beca I mean, because it's not a problem that you can solve in five years. But they are good businessmen. The Muslim Brotherhood own they own businesses that are thriving. That even when they were outlawed, quote, you've got eighty. You've got eighty million people in Egypt. I mean, this is a much bigger problem than any one group in Egypt can solve, sure. and it's a much bigger problem uh, than you know than can be solved in one parliamentary term and because any kind of economic reform always involves some you know some dislocation some pain before you have gain and you have a population that's now activist and willing to go to the square and go to the government buildings in order to protest i see actually the next period being one of significant instability here and so managing this is going to be very difficult i'm a political scientist not an economist so i don't know how we're going to solve it I don't think the Muslim Brotherhood has a magic business wand. No, but just, um, just as a one, one point of, of what I would say is the Muslim Brotherhood now confronts the challenge of making the economy work. And the reason... Well, all of Egypt does. The, right. the reason they were protecting parliament is because they now control it. Right. And that's now not just power, that's the burden of responsibility. But the biggest challenge the Muslim Brotherhood has right now, and they're not saying it, but Hamzawi is, Amr Hamzawi is, is that the military is going to have to make its budget transparent. It controls up to 40% of, 30% by sort of dramatic estimates, 20% by others, of the entire Egyptian economy. It has hotels, wedding halls, gas stations. They, they own all the toll roads. They control a very large sector of the military. It's corrupt. It's built on nepotism. It's, it's perks. And the U.S. government has a critical role in making sure the military does that. So if the U.S. is going to put its oar in the water to help the, the Egyptian economy work, one of the places they can begin and be extremely productive is getting the military to finally be transparent about its budget, to which we give $1.3 billion a year. Thanks, Juan. Uh, my name is Mustafa Hoshi, and I'm from Egypt. I just work in Boston, came for the lecture. Um, my question was kind of around how optimistic or pessimistic are you in terms of the ability of secular parties to conduct effective grassroots campaigns to compete with the Islamists? I mean, I know historically, right, the Mubarak regime kind of stifled the secular opposition given international acceptance and such, but, um, you know, just given, uh, you know, the Salafi success overperformance and I guess this relative secular underperformance in the last elections, just your thoughts on you know being on the ground. How do you see that playing out? How what's the time frame you see if it were to be successful and so on? You know, I, a lot of the people who asked to meet me when I was in Cairo wanted to talk about things like 
reinterpretation of Islam, different kinds of Islam, a liberal Islam, other, other kinds of Islams than, than the Islam that is put forward by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, which says to me that, that many people are recognizing that the way to challenge both those two movements is through a religiously based, somewhat religiously based uh, approach because they recognize that Egypt is a, is a conservative country, they recognize the pivotal, pivotal role of religion. But we also have to recognize that there are li secular liberal Egyptians who have been sidelined, as you said, because, I mean, as I said earlier as well, Mubarak had himself had the Muslim Brotherhood, left the mosque alone, and so those of us who identified with neither really had very little room for maneuver. The Muslim Brotherhood, to their credit, what they, what they, what they did do was they went out there and provided the social services that the regime never did. They ne the regime neglected all these people. And so my question then is, where were the secular liberal groups, and why didn't they go out to find out why, what the average Egyptian wanted? So this is, this is really the challenge of secular liberal groups in Egypt, not just alternative interpretations of religion, but going out there and finding out what the average Egyptian wants. And, and now, and sorry, and doing it. Right, exactly, because now they recognize that, you know, you need to go out there and actually campaign for people's votes. Now, some of those groups, the, the, the Salafis, were giving out meat some of them were giving out oil. Some of them were giving out gas canisters. Okay, that's, you know, my, instead of money for votes, it's meat for votes. That's the reality on the ground in Egypt. So get out there and find out what you need to do. But for me, I know as a secular liberal Egyptian, whenever I go to Egypt and I'm interviewed about my particular leanings, I make sure I use the word secular, al-mani, because it has such a dirty connotation in Egypt. To say you're secular almost means that you, you are an atheist. So we're actually having to dismantle, deconstruct the language. Because for the longest time, we had conservative Islam from the Muslim Brotherhood, conservative Islam from Mubarak to fight it. And those of us, we are now fighting the authentic label, that you can be authentic and Muslim and not conservative. That's our challenge, that you can be liberal and authentic. And also, we have Christians in Egypt. Why should they have to identify with Islam? This is an important question, yeah. so, yeah. and I know that guy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, so well, I also I, wanted to I, ask about the Christians, too. About well, this Christians. is important. Um, so I, I actually agree 100% uh, with Mona. <laughs> but, but part of the issue here is that the liberals, during this campaign, they didn't do themselves any favors, right? So w when they would campaign, they would talk about the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafis uh, want to implement Islam, and we want to do something else. And so the average Egyptian who is very sentimental and likes Islam says, OK, so I got the one party that's for Islam and the other party that's not for Islam. And the party that's for Islam is giving me meat. And, and so it's a no-brainer. What needs to happen is that the terms of political debate need to shift. And the secular liberal parties need to stop talking about being secular and liberal and start talking about things like redistribution, right? Unemployment, right? The Muslim Brotherhood doesn't want to have, I mean, I'm just going to make this up, you know, doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to have very progressive taxes, for example, and we do, right? Make that the issue, and then all of this other stuff will take care of itself. But if you keep on making the issue, I'm secular, I, you know, love me because I'm secular, forget it. You're not, nobody's going to love you. But you can get elected if you say, I'm going to redistribute to you if you're poor. And that's what the game has to become. Yeah. But someone has to make the fight point. for secular, though. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. Because but not you the need part. someone on he's, the edge. Not if you want to get he's, elected. He's, 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 he's taking the pragmatic <laughs> point that you have to just reframe. Because no, no, I understand. But, well, the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they promote a free market philosophy for business. And one, one of the chants of this revolution is social justice. So if you, if you present yourself as championing the poor by giving the poor what they need, but you're actual, you're a free market person, then you know you get all the, the social justice people coming in and talking about redistribution. So there is room for maneuver here, and I think they've missed that room. You may be a friend, but you're still allowed to speak. <laughs> Hi, my name's Matt Lewis. I'm a national security fellow here at Harvard uh, for the year. Um, I think uh, Professor uh, Masood brought it up about their, their rapidly declining reserves, capital reserves, and the government's going to be bankrupt here within the next few months, which presents a real threat um, in terms of security of the country of, of what if the country goes bankrupt and the, and the risk of radicalization? Um, and my question is, is U.S. policy that if, if uh, Egypt does go bankrupt and they start to look for reserves or they look for a loan, uh, what would be your advice to the, uh, to the State Department about uh, lending money to Egypt? The military is already loaning its own government money. I, but I think that's tied to the security with uh, the 1979 Accords. And as long as they respect the Accords, I think we'll still provide no, I mean, the that economic assistance to the military. The I'm, I'm speaking reserve. more of the, just That's the good. actual res capital reserves for, to keep the economy going. I don't know what the, we, we can do. I mean, if you haven't noticed, we're in pretty dire straits here in the US uh, <laughs> ourselves. But I do think that um, 
this is something that we're going to have to confront. And you know, if, if we don't or Europe doesn't uh, kick in, then who will, right? Will it be Saudi Arabia, for example? And what price will Saudi Arabia extract uh, for that aid? But I think you're right to, that we need to think about this. I, I would just say that. Can I ask each one of you now? Because I think sure. we're, we are already yeah. wrapping up. I mean, what outcome should we want, should America want, yeah. in this current melting pot that we uh, see for what's going to happen? I mean, I think this is an extraordinary historic moment, of course, for Egypt. But I also think it's an extraordinary moment for America. This is a time for the United States to, to, to seize an opportunity to have a new dialogue with, quote, Islamists. They are in power in the most populous nation in the Arab world in the middle of a dramatic, historic unfolding of change and tumult. And if they seize the opportunity to create a new kind of dialogue, it could have a ripple effect that could really, I think, benefit the United States in the post 9-11 era, you know, whole new engagement. I would just do a wrink wrinkle on what uh, Charlie said. I don't think it's a moment for the United States to begin a new dialogue with Islamists. I think it's a moment for the United States to begin a new dialogue with Arabs, right, who are finally beginning to be able to take charge of their own politics and who are going to want to be respected and who's, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be democratic citizens too, hopefully, and we should respect them at, on that level. So that's what I think that, uh, you know, the United States, we can talk about all kinds of short-term, uh, you know, ways in which this is not in our short-term interests to have uh, Arab countries who are going to pursue foreign policies that are not necessarily aligned with ours. But if you keep the long view, it's better to have uh, well-functioning democracies there than not. And so that's what we should be supporting. Well said. I agree. Um, I think what's happening in Egypt and the region generally, but I'm focusing on Egypt not just because I'm Egyptian, but it's pivotal to the region, is nothing short of a seismic shift for the whole world, not just for the US. I think what we're seeing happening is a, a renegotiation between the ruled and the rulers. You're seeing it influencing people across the world. You mentioned the Occupy movement and the way that it's been influenced by what's happening in Egypt. And I think this, this idea of US foreign policy that for far too long has favored this notion, this elusive notion of stability through some dictator somewhere across the world has to truly end once and for all. Because, you know, we, we have this on-off switch here where George Bush says he likes democracy and then Hamas get voted in and he suddenly doesn't like democracy anymore. And, you know, we, we revert back to our, our stable dictator. This all has to end, this idea of stability coming from a dictator. So I think what we're seeing happening in Egypt is people demanding the, the people power itself, that, that stability and that freedom and that ultimately the happiness of a population that is able to freely choose its own destiny. That's what foreign policy should be talking about. The US has been very slow over every single revolution we're seeing. It's, it's basically still, still to this day, playing catch up. And I'm not really sure it understands the tremendous shifts happening, but I'm hoping as an Egyptian and, a, and as a new American, that this country understands that this stability comes from the people and not from a dictator. It's that simple. Well, thank you very much. I think we could go on very much. We're definitely going to go on talking over dinner, I suspect, because I think we're not quite resolved any of these issues. But it's been very stimulating and terrific conversation. And I want to thank everyone here for coming. I'm sorry to those questioners who didn't get their question out. And uh, thank you very much indeed to IOP and to Open Hands and to the Shorenstein Institute. Thank you. <laughs> terrific. Now you can thank slug you. out was your that, Was that OK? Oh, was you were fantastic. Okay? You were really great. I'm so happy. But you two should go on the road. Uh, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, terrific. Bill Balboni. How are you? Great. How's everything? That was terrific. You Thank you so much. You're all absolutely job. great.